Okay, our next lecturer is uh, going to be Dr. Jeffrey Herbener. It's his uh, second time at the podium today. Uh, his lecture now is on capital interest. Jeff? Okay, the main um, task in this lecture is to uh, complete the uh, discussion uh, from earlier this morning about uh, economic calculation, where we saw that in economic theory, we start with preferences, we start with the human mind, we start with the human person, and uh, from there show how, uh, from uh, judgments of the human mind, uh, all of the different uh, aspects uh, that we normally refer to as economic uh, come into being. Um, uh, demands and supplies, our actions, in other words, and then prices based upon those, and then once we get prices of consumer goods, how uh, they, um, uh, are imputed to uh, the factors of production. And then when we have uh, factor prices, how entrepreneurs use uh, these prices as a basis for performing economic calculation, uh, first of uh, net income or of gross profit, uh, their revenues from uh, producing output uh, relative to their uh, costs of production, uh, in order to economize uh, the use of factors of production in the division of labor. And then uh, what we want to focus on, uh, especially in this lecture, is um, uh, the second uh, form of economic calculation, which is the calculation of equity or net worth, uh, the balance sheet that the uh, uh, entrepreneur uh, uh, constructs uh, to show uh, assets relative to liabilities and the net worth or equity uh, involved in the operation. Uh, and as we'll uh, point out, this um, calculation the entrepreneurs use to uh, determine whether or not uh, certain uh, asset uh, acquisitions or combinations uh, either add to equity or subtract from it. And therefore, they can make capital investment decisions in a way that uh, also economizes. <clears throat> uh, now, in order to uh, uh, get to that uh, discussion, uh, let's uh, backtrack and go uh, back into some of the uh, more basic uh, principles, and then we'll uh, build from uh, these. And uh, perhaps uh, I should just say also one note of introduction on uh, interest. The title of the uh, talk is Capital and Interest. So uh, <clears throat> interest comes in, uh, you, perhaps you can see this right away, interest comes in uh, with respect to the intertemporal dimension of capital. So once we have durable goods, then if we're going to properly price them, we have to take account of the intertemporal uh, aspect. That is to say, we have a capital good or, or a plot of land or uh, uh, durable consumer goods that will generate uh, valuable uh, services for us in the future. How do we value them today? How do we assess their value um, and make it uh, commensurate with uh, the value of things that uh, are non-durable? So that's where the discussion of interest come in, comes into the picture. Okay, so let's start with capital goods. Uh, so we'll backtrack all the way just to these basic principles. We had talked uh, this morning about means uh, that we use to attain our ends. We can uh, now uh, notice the uh, distinction between uh, two different basic types of means. They're consumer goods on the one hand. Consumer goods uh, directly satisfy our ends in one action. So we take a ham sandwich and we eat it, and uh, that's a consumer good because our uh, end is attained. <clears throat> then there are producer goods, as distinguished from uh, consumer goods. Producer goods only indirectly satisfy our ends. Uh, they do this by, of course, producing consumer goods that then directly satisfy our ends. Within producer goods, we have um, what Rothbard calls original factors of production and then uh, produced factors of production. The important distinction here uh, is that original factors of production are independently productive a plot of land, labor, these are original factors of production. Produced factors of production, of course, are, since they're produced by other factors of production, are not independently productive. Their uh, productivity and the value that they have of this productivity will be imputed back to the factors of production that produce them. But this uh, won't be the case with labor uh, and with land. Okay, then we have uh, the, the causal laws that uh, relate to uh, producer goods uh, as means to attain ends. And we want to pay special uh, attention just to two, uh, two aspects of these causal laws. 
First, we can talk about the causal laws that exist within each production process. So if we have a, we have a factory producing Honda Civics, we have an ice cream shop producing chocolate ice cream cones, uh, whatever the particular production, uh, the complementary factors of production that have been brought together by the entrepreneur happen to be in this production process, then uh, there is some uh, alternative for the entrepreneur to vary this complementary set, uh, set of factors of production. So an autom automobile production could be arranged in a uh, more capital intensive manner or in a less capital intensive, more handmade production process. Um, and, and, and so on, right? In, in almost every uh, particular uh, production process we might imagine, there are varying proportions that the complementary factors can be combined in without losing all output. You still get, you still get some output. So it's possible to calculate what uh, we call in economics the marginal physical product of each factor of production, uh, what a unit of it adds to output. <clears throat> um, so just to give you a, a simple illustration of this, let's say I want to uh, mow my lawn. And uh, I can do this in, with many different sets of complementary factors of production. So I can just uh, buy a push mower and you know, maybe it takes two hours of my labor services. Um, I have a mowed lawn. Uh, if I want a more capital intensive production process, I could buy a riding lawn mower and then maybe it only takes me a half hour of labor, right? I'm combining things in a different way. I could uh, buy one of those old, uh, you ever seen those old reel mowers? You know, that are, they just, they turn on a reel, they're sort of torqued like DNA, and they, they spin and cut. Uh, so I could buy one of those reel mowers, I could get you know, a pair of scissors and go out, and I wanted to you know, economize on capital. I could do it that way. Uh, and as we said before, the way in which I would choose this in my own personal action is based upon my, uh, my preferences, right? my, my subjective values. So how I see the economizing alternatives, how I judge the value of the different alternatives. But the point here simply is that we can vary uh, the uh, factors of production that we use to accomplish the same end. And therefore, these become choice variables for us. And then there's certain causal laws that are in place with respect to these choice variables. We wish to, again, examine these uh, to some extent. Now, the second uh, aspect of uh, any production process that we want to note is that <clears throat> different factors of production will have different specificity. And this, too, then becomes part of the choice nexus for an individual deciding uh, which set of complementary factors to use in any particular production process. Specificity refers to whether or not if we transfer the use of the factor out of this production into something else, whether or not that factor retains its productivity. If it loses all of its productivity when we shift it out of the production process that we've put it into, then we say it's highly specific to that production process. So for example, a push mower uh, is, uh, I think at least, uh, more specific than a riding lawn mower. Because a push mower, as far as I know, will do only thing but mow lawns. It won't, won't do anything else, right? If I, I can't use it to produce type documents or to, um, you know, to, draw, to, to uh, transport me to a work or something, maybe with great ingenuity I could, but you can't just do it uh, with, the, with the push mower itself. But a riding lawn mower you could do different things with, right? You don't have to mow the lawn. You could push snow with it. You could, I guess, if you were careful, you could uh, ride it to work. Or, you know, do other sorts of things. So, so it's a little bit less specific. And if we think about, the, uh, if we think about uh, different factors of production as we defined them before, labor, natural resources, or land, and capital goods, there's a general uh, progression of specificity. Labor tends to be the least specific of all the factors of production, generally speaking. You can find particular cases where this isn't so. Uh, land tends to be somewhat more specific. And capital goods tend to be the most specific. By the way, this is precisely why when we have uh, booms and busts in the economy, that the most problematic part of reallocating factors of production during the bust is not labor, because labor, after all, is nonspecific or relatively nonspecific. It's capital goods. It's capital goods whose prices have to adjust more radically to make it profitable to reemploy them in areas, uh, lines of production uh, that they have not been designed to uh, uh, for efficient production. 
whereas labor can move more easily. So other things the same, um, this creates the problem, right? This is something that uh, non-Austrian schools of thought tend to overlook entirely. The whole problem of the uh, capital structure and how it has to be realigned uh, when we go through the boom and the bust. <clears throat> and then finally, let me mention uh, durability. The durability of a factor then is also um, uh, an element that has to be taken into account when a person decides what production process will I put together to engage in this, uh, uh, in the attainment of this end. <clears throat> uh, because different to factors of production will have different degrees of durability. The different degrees of durability will then have different intertemporal implications. So the riding lawnmower again might last for 10 years, the push mower might last for 20. And so whether or not you invest in one or the other might depend in part upon that durability. Um, and, and again, we'll see how this plays out in our discussion. Okay, now, uh, we're, for our purposes in this lecture, we're more concerned not with this, uh, this uh, production process for each good. We're more concerned with the production processes for the entire economy. What uh, Rothbard calls the structure of production, or what I've called on this uh, slide, the capital structure. <laughs> so not only is it true that in each production process for each good, we have different complementary factors combined together to produce the good. So for example, we have our Honda Civic, and there's some Honda factory in, I don't know, Canada or wherever they make these. And on, in the factory, they combine natural resources. They have land that the factory sits on, maybe other natural resources, labor. A certain amount of time is involved. And then there are all these capital goods, right? There are fenders and tires and steering wheels and seats and engine parts and so on and so forth. And then you have the factory and the assembly line and the labor and so on and so forth and all the uh, production processes being undertaken uh, in order to produce the car. But since capital goods are produced factors of production, the fenders, the paint, the tires, they have to be produced as well in a separate production process. And so we have a, uh, a production process uh, prior to the assembly of the car where the, where the fenders are made out of steel, right? And then uh, the paints are made out of oil and dyes and the uh, tires are made out of rubber and steel cords and so on and so forth. And it doesn't take too much imagination to see that these stages of production progress uh, to fairly uh, high degrees. You have many, many stages of production, not just these lower, you know, so-called lower stages of production. But uh, the production process can be traced back to higher and higher stages of production until we eventually reach the extraction of raw materials. So we mine iron ore out of the ground, ship it, process it, uh, then we make steel out of it, and then we ship the steel, and we make a steel fender out of it, and then we make the, you know, once we have the fender, we ship it to the auto factory, and we make the car. So the whole economy can be depicted by this production structure. The production structure is the economy. It's all economic production in the economy. This is, uh, to put it differently, this is the macro economy. Uh, once again, you can see the distinction between the Austrian treatment here and the uh, mainstream treatment, especially at, say, a sort of naive Keynesian treatment, where the macro economy is just like or aggregate supply, you know, or C is equal to, to uh, or Y is equal to C plus I plus G or something like this, right? The degree of aggregation uh, in these uh, models in the mainstream obscures all of the insights that can be gained by recognizing the, that the economy is actually all of these microeconomic processes, all of these intertwining uh, uh, economic processes that are uh, producing, as we sometimes say, heterogeneous capital goods, right? Different capital goods in different ways or entrepreneurs are overseeing all of this in each of the different production processes and coordinating all the production and so on. This is what we have to grapple with, at least in part, uh, in uh, macro uh, economics. <clears throat> now let me mention just a few, uh, we might call these features of this capital structure, or the, of the uh, production structure. Uh, again, it doesn't take too much imagination to see that this, this capital structure or the economy in its production aspect is extremely complex. Uh, the, the estimate is that there are uh, several million different types of consumer goods produced in the American economy. There was some uh, uh, computer geek who wanted to try to actually count the number of different 
kinds of products that are produced in the American economy. And you got the uh, bright idea of just uh, looking at all the different barcodes. Aren't these all registered somewhere? Can't you just find them and just sort of count how many of them are there? He counted them and he came up with over a billion. Now, of course, that would include presumably producer goods as well as consumer goods. But so, so there's a vast complexity to the capitalist production structure, far uh, beyond the capability of a human mind to even comprehend, let alone design. Now, secondly, the structure of production is flexible. Even though there's structure to it, it can be changed. And entrepreneurs um, who are overseeing each production process then are in a position to use economic calculation and appraisement based upon it to determine the economy, economizing ways in which to change production, <clears throat> to reallocate factors of production. So let's say, uh, just in our example, the Honda Civic, let's say that... Uh, the Honda Civic is produced in three different colors by Honda, red, white, and blue. And they find that the blue sells better than the white. And so they, they'd like to adjust to these consumer preferences. They anticipate that they'll persist in the future uh, by producing more blue Honda Civics. So this is easy for them to do, right? It's a simple matter for them to simply call up their uh, paint suppliers and say, look, we need more blue paint. Let, let's get a contract. You know, what would we have to pay to get another shipment? Uh, and uh, if their current supplier doesn't wish to do this, uh, doesn't want to make this contract, hey, wait, we've got a contract for white, you know, forget it, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, change, they'll just call somebody else. And then more dyes have to be made to make more blue paint, right? And the same process is set in motion. And since entrepreneurs make their profit by anticipating these changes, they're already doing this. Right? But before the demand is hit, before they find out that more uh, uh, blue cars are, be, are being preferred by consumers. They've already predicted this. This is how they earn their profit and capitalize themselves and stay in business. <clears throat> now, finally, let me uh, just mention that this structure is obviously then a structure. It's coordinated, right? It hangs together. It has a, um, a structure to it. It isn't uh, completely malleable, but uh, has a certain... Uh, rigidity to it. <clears throat> uh, but this, uh, this uh, coordination we can see again just by thinking of this simple diagram is brought about uh, by the same basic processes we spoke of, of earlier uh, today. It's brought about by the desire for participants in human action always to obtain a preferable state of affairs, uh, to uh, engage when they're engaged in social interaction, to engage in mutually beneficial um, associations, mutually beneficial trades, right? And so this happens, of course, as businessmen trade with other businessmen, as the entrepreneurs trade with other entrepreneurs. This is how the whole structure of production gets coordinated. How do we know, uh, you, know you hear this from political science majors or politicians, you know, how do, how do we know that we're going to get the right amount of iron mined? Don't we have to control this from Washington? You know, what, if, what, if the, what if the greedy entrepreneurs produce too much and so on? Well, well no, the economic theoretical uh, understanding of this is that it's precisely because entrepreneurs engage in mutually profitable uh, adventures, right? The iron producer produces the right amount of iron for the steel manufacturer to buy because the steel manufacturer makes it profitable to produce that amount of iron, no more, no less, no you know, not different kinds, but the kind they need to make us, uh, you know, to sell, make steel fenders and sell them to the auto companies, and so on. So we see this imputation process of value that we spoke about before, permeating the entire uh, structure of production. <clears throat> now, let me say uh, just one one last uh, feature of the capital structure. When we think about it as the macro economy, this is uh, one of uh, uh, Murray Rothbard's great points, is that uh, it's quite obvious that the macroeconomy, the production activity in the macroeconomy is heavily weighted toward the production of uh, producer goods. The production of consumer goods is only a small part of it. For every consumer good that's produced, you have a huge number of stages of production of the production of producer goods that are necessary to complete it, of capital goods, necessary to complete it. The fixation that the Keynesians have on, uh, on consumption is misplaced. Uh, it simply isn't true that consumption is 70% of the, of the, you know, as they say, 70% of the economy. It's not true. It's 70% of, 
of the net production, but not 70% of the gross production, right? Of the production of all things in the economy. Most of it is the production of capital goods. And that that's, seems like it would be important to know this, right? And incorporate it into your macro analysis. Okay, now let's turn to the rate of interest. <clears throat> Uh, because we, uh, because it's quite obvious that uh, the physical arrangement of the different factors of production is not sufficient for e economizing decisions to be made about how how to choose between the different production processes and you know these choices of how much iron to mine and so on and so forth that we spoke about before. We need valuation, or we need uh, we need uh, valuation first from the consumers and then uh, appraisement uh, prices um, uh, for the entrepreneur to make these decisions. And uh, as we begin then to move from capital goods to capital, so here's our distinction between these terms. Capital goods refers to the physical producer goods. Capital refers to their monetary value. Capital is just a, sometimes we say capital value. We're just referring to their uh, monetary price. And as I mentioned before, one key element of the uh, price of a capital good will uh, come from its durability, its intertemporal delivering of services. And so this uh, is what gets us to the interest rate. Now on Wednesday, we'll talk about the interest rate in some, in some depth. So we're, we're gonna kind of uh, just mention the high points here of an interest. So if you have questions about this, uh, uh, we'll address them in the lecture on Wednesday on the pure time preference theory of interest. Okay. The rate of interest starts just like all uh, 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 appraisement uh, elements start with uh, preferences. Start with mental judgments. What is the mental judgment from which the interest rate emerges? It's what we call time preference. And time preference is the preference that we have to satisfy a given end sooner as opposed to later. So it's the preference that everyone has to obtain a, a given satisfaction sooner as opposed to later. Now, if we have this preference, <clears throat> then it follows that there would be what Mises calls originary interest. When we trade present money for future money, present money will trade at a premium. This is because if we command present money, we can satisfy a given end right now in the present. If all we have is future money, well, that's not preferable, right, to satisfy that same end in the future. So a given amount of present money will trade for a premium for a given amount of future money. And again, we'll talk more about this in the lecture on Wednesday. <clears throat> so this is where the uh, interest rate uh, comes from. Uh, if we take this simple example, let's say we have uh, someone with a preference rank over here on the top. Because of time preference, $1,000 today is preferred, ranked above $1,000 in a year. But there might be some amount of money in the future that would rank above $1,000 today. So for this guy, it's $1,250. So this guy would prefer to get $1,250 in one year as opposed to $1,000 today. But just like everybody, he prefers $1,000 today to $1,000 in one year. And so this, it is this preference then that gives rise to uh, demand and supply, uh, lending and borrowing, and then the uh, rate of interest. Now, uh, notice that uh, when we do a simple calculation, if we take this 25% premium um, uh, that this person has for future money relative to present, we can see that once an interest rate is formulated, then what the interest rate does is make future money and present money equivalent. It tells us how much present money is equivalent to how much future money. So if the interest rate is 25%, if I have $1,000 in my hand, I can lend it out on interest, end of a year, I have $1,250. Those two are equivalent sums, right? I now, th therefore, can calculate the present value of future money. I, I know what a sum of future money is worth in present money because the interest rate makes it uh, comparable. I have. I can take either option, right? I can trade at par either $1,250 in the future, which I might get from selling something in the future, for $1,000 today. So that, that's what these calculations show, right? Just simple, the simple calculation of future value, the present value um, compounded by, by the uh, rate of interest, and the present value, the future value discounted 
by the rate of interest. These are equivalent calculations. <clears throat> Okay, then we want to move to the time market where the interest rate is determined. So this time preference is the basis for the time market. And uh, just like in any market, uh, trade depends upon people having different preferences. And as long as their preferences are different, uh, there's a possibility for mutually advantageous trade. And uh, the same thing uh, then can happen with the trade of present money for future money. So uh, let's take uh, this example, the market clearing rate of interest. Some of this relies upon what we talked about this morning. Let's say we have this borrower, uh, person A, and again, the uh, items in parenthesis are things that the uh, person does not have. So this person does not have $1,000 of present money, and this person is willing to trade uh, 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 at, at the uh, a premium of $300, $1,300 of future money for $1,000 uh, today. Or if this person were uh, purchasing, borrowing, uh, present uh, present money, they'd be willing to acquire this thousand dollars of present money for a future payment of twelve fifty. Right? So the time preference uh, premium is twenty five percent. Borrower B is a little less eager to borrow because borrower B is only willing to pay a fifteen percent premium to acquire the present money, the thousand dollars today. He's willing to pay uh, one thousand one hundred fifty in in uh, a year. And borrower C is the least eager borrower, willing only to pay a 5% premium. <clears throat> uh, lender X then has lower time preferences, as we say, right? Less intense preference for the present. So notice lender X is willing to accept uh, a 5% premium in future money to surrender in trade $1,000 of present money. So he's the most eager lender. Y is less eager, only willing to lend at a 15% premium. And lender Z is the least eager, only willing to lend at a 25% premium. So borrowers have higher time preferences. They're willing to pay larger premiums in order to acquire present money. Uh, lenders have lower time preferences. They're willing to accept lower premiums to make these trades. The interest rate emerges, the market clearing rate emerges just like it does for goods. Then it would be that rate uh, where the quantity demand of present money, the quantity demand lent, and the quantity demand uh, borrowed are equal. Uh, at uh, higher uh, interest rates, there'd be an excess supply of lending over borrowing and unsatisfied lenders. At uh, lower interest rates, there'd be an excess demand and unsatisfied uh, borrowers. That's why there aren't interest rates above or below the market clearing rate. That's why the market clearing rate of interest emerges. <laughs> so this is how we go from preferences to the market clearing interest rate. Uh, now, the next step is just to uh, point out that uh, in the time market, the time market again is all the lending of present money for future money that occurs in, in human life, in society. Uh, we can divide the time market into two components. There are credit markets, and credit markets then are where credit transactions are made, where people make a contract to uh, lend and borrow future, uh, present money for future money. So we have a contractual obligation to pay back, for the borrower to pay back uh, future money of a stipulated amount, given that we've been lent uh, present money of a, of a given amount. So uh, we have uh, credit markets on the one hand. These credit markets can further be broken down into uh, lending that goes to consumers, the consumer loan markets. So there would be mortgages and auto loans and credit cards and so on and so forth in the consumer loan markets. These are part of the credit markets. <clears throat> and then uh, there would be producer loan markets where entrepreneurs borrow in order to buy producer goods instead of consumers borrowing in order to buy consumer goods. And uh, you know, this is, uh, there's the AAA uh, corporate bond market, the junk bond market, um, and so on. Then the second part of the time market is the structure of production itself. So in the structure of production, in production processes, the capitalist entrepreneur advances money to the owners of factors of production, goes through the production process, and then sells the output sometime in the future, earning the revenue from the customer for the sale of the good. So there's a lending-borrowing relationship uh, that exists within most production processes. Again, this isn't a necessary feature of production processes in the market, but it's uh, typical because 
workers have higher time preferences than the capitalist entrepreneur. They want to be paid every week or every two weeks or every month. They're not willing to, uh, you know, auto workers aren't willing to uh, uh, produce a car and then wait for eight months for the car to be sold, right? They're not willing to go to work every day and then, okay, when that, when that car is sold, you'll be paid your wages. <clears throat> no, typically they want to be paid uh, up front. They want to be advanced the money. And when they are advanced the money, that's part of the time market. And of course, the capitalist entrepreneur, because he or she is lending, will be earning the rate of interest. There's an interest return that's earned by the capitalist entrepreneur for investing these uh, present funds and advancing them to the uh, owners of the factors of production. Going through the production process and then receiving the future money and the payment uh, when the good is uh, sold. So the capitalist entrepreneur earns the price spread between uh, the stages of production uh, in, our, in our original diagram. <laughs> okay, now with this as background, we can go to capital value and the, uh, uh, what we're after here, which is the uh, purchase price of capital goods. Now the intermediate step here is to talk about the, uh, the rental price <clears throat> of capital goods. So factors of production can have rental prices where all that's being bought is a unit of service of the good. Wages are like this, obviously, right? So we have, have a, our uh, ice cream parlor owner and he uh, hires a, a scoop meister, you know, to work and uh, uh, just, uh, you know, pays uh, daily or weekly for the services of, uh, of the labor that's being bought. Uh, maybe he rents his equipment as well. He could rent uh, the freezers, in which case he would just pay a rental price. He would pay just for the service of that capital good. <clears throat> uh, but he could buy the uh, he could buy the uh, the freezer. He could buy his uh, his uh, store, you know, the physical building, and so on and so forth. Uh, or he could rent them. So there are rental prices on the one hand, and then purchase prices on the other. So let's think about uh, rental prices first uh, of factors of production, and then we'll talk about the uh, uh, purchase prices. Now, the entrepreneurial demand for the factors of production will be what determines the rental price, just like the demand for anything determines its price. And as we've seen already, the entrepreneur's demand depends upon what effect the possession of the unit of service of this capital good has on revenues and costs. How will it affect net income? So the entrepreneur must estimate, if I hire a unit of service of a factor of production, what will it add to my revenues? Depending on what it adds to revenues, he, he'll be in a position then to estimate what it is he should pay, you know, what he's willing to pay to hire that factor of production. Now to take a, uh, an example to illustrate this, uh, let's use Derek Jeter. Okay, we got Derek Jeter, new, uh, shortstop for the New York Yankees, right? <clears throat> and uh, okay, let, let's say, this is for the sake of the argument, and I think this is actually the case, let's say he has an annual contract. And I think uh, 2011, his contract is for $14.7 million. Now, how do the, how did the entrepreneurs that, uh, of the Yankees come up with this number? Where, where do they get to, why do they think that they can pay Jeter $14.7 million? Why not $12 million? Why not $20 million? Where, where does this number come from? And the answer is this number comes from their estimate of what they believe Jeter is adding to the revenues of the Yankees. So Jeter plays, right? He gets a certain number of hits. Some fans come out just to see Derek play. Uh, he gets his 3,000th hit, so, so now you can sell Derek Jeter bobbleheads with, you know, I got 3,000 hit signs on them or whatever. So he, there's memorabilia, there are playoff revenues, and so on and so forth. Right? This is how they do it. They're, they're the entrepreneurs. They can figure this out. They can make these estimates. By the way, if, if the guys who run the Yankees can't make these estimates, then they won't be owners of the Yankees for long, right? There'll be other, other uh, people happy to step in and take over. Uh, who can better perform this function. And in fact, the capitalists will ensure this because they'll decapitalize, as we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the entrepreneurs are unable to perform in terms of generating uh, net income and net worth. 
Now, here's, the, here's how the interest rate plays into this. Uh, let's suppose, again, just for the sake of the argument, and then we'll add some uh, complexities to it, but let's suppose just for the sake of the argument that the uh, entrepreneurs of the Yankees think, you know, we, we think that Derek Jeter, by adding his performance, by his marginal physical product over the year of you know, getting a certain number of hits and on-base percentage and the way he lifts the other players' uh, performance and his defense and whatever, um, will we'll add $14.7 million to the revenues of the Yankees. This is in the sale of tickets and playoff revenue and memorabilia sales and so on and so forth. Let, again, for the sake of the argument, let's just assume that they think, what would we be willing to pay Jeter up front to, you know, in April, on April 1st? We paid him his full contract up front to get this revenue stream that's going to exist for several years. Let's still be selling you know, memorabilia and so on maybe for several years. Well, in order to answer that, they would have to discount the future revenues, right? What would it be worth to have Derek Jeter generate a million dollars worth of playoff revenue in October? Would it, what, what's it worth to the entrepreneurs to pay him in April to do that? Well, not a million dollars, right? Something less than that, the discounted value of it. Because after all, they could just take their capital, invest it in the credit markets and earn that interest return, right? Why invest it in Derek Jeter if you're not going to earn that return? <clears throat> okay, so the demand for the entrepreneur depends upon the discounted marginal revenue product, as we say, of the factor. How much revenue the factor generates, how much additional revenue that factor generates by having the factor employed, discounted by the time, the intertemporal time delay between paying the factor and receiving the revenue. Now, with Derek Jeter, of course, there, there are all sorts of complexities in the contract, right? He gets playoff, he gets a portion of the playoff revenue, he gets bonuses and so on, performance bonuses. Those wouldn't be as heavily discounted, right? Because they won't be paid till November, or when, whenever the performance is forthcoming. So, so there are all sorts of nuances involved in the contract, but the basic principle is still the same. If you're going to advance money, the capitalists will not do this unless they're going to earn interest. And therefore, they're going to discount what they're willing to pay in the present from what they think they'll earn on the investment in the future. This is then uh, determines the uh, rental price. <laughs> uh, so let's take uh, just a, a, a simple a numeric example of this. Let's suppose we have uh, here our net income, uh, revenue minus cost, and we have these marginal revenue products for the three different factors, capital, land, and labor to be received in one year when the uh, interest rate is 25%. So in one year, the good is going to be sold for $17,500, the sum of the marginal revenue products of all the factors that go into producing it. And the question is, how much will the uh, capitalist entrepreneur pay today in order to get this $17,500 if the interest rate's 25%? And the answer is $14,000. They'll be willing to pay $8,000 to buy the capital good, 4,000 to get the land, 2,000 to get the labor. And when they do this, they'll earn $3,500, which on their investment of 14,000 is 25%. You see, this is a crucial point, right? <laughs> when the capitalist invests in a production process, we're setting profit aside, we're setting the entrepreneurial uncertainty and the profit earned from anticipation, we're setting that aside in this example. The entrepreneur, the capitalist entrepreneur, is earning the interest rate. Right? He's earning an interest return. Precisely because what he's doing is advancing money to these factor owners. He's just lending. And for that lending, he earns the rate of interest. So this is reflected in, uh, in the production process. Right? Because it's reflected in the, in the value of these factors of production. And which ones then will be used in different production processes and which ones will be uh, produced more heavily, and so on. <clears throat> now, uh, given, given then that this is, the, this is what uh, stands behind demand for the factors of production, for the rental services of the factors of production, we, we won't have time to go through this, but uh, you know, we check out uh, Man, Economy, and State, and you, you can see the logistics of this. It's pretty easy to show that there, just like there are for consumer goods, there'll be a downward sloping demand curve for the, uh, the entrepreneurs buying the factors of production and an upward sloping supply curve by the factor owners supplying it. This means that the, there'll be a market clearing price, right? Because just as in all cases, if, if you start at really high prices 
And uh, at very high prices, you have excess supply. As you lower the price, the quantity demand goes up and the quantity supply goes down, and eventually the two will meet. Eventually the market will clear. And then if, as you push the price down even further, you know, hypothetically, right, the quantity demand will increase. Above the quantity supply, you'll have excess demand. So the, so the market will clear, just like it will in uh, consumer goods markets. And at that market clearing price, the, uh, there'll be a discounted marginal revenue product that emerges for the factor of production. There'll be, there'll be a, you know, a going well, wage rate, let's say, for manual labor that exists throughout the economy for that type of manual labor, no matter where it's allocated. Because if it had a higher price somewhere else, it would be reallocated there. And then the greater profitability of the activity where the price is lower would eventually adjust. So this is just part of the production adjustment process. <clears throat> okay, now let's go on to the purchase price of the capital good. This is what we want to get, uh, we want to get at. And here we move on to the uh, economic calculation of net worth or, or uh, equity. This is actually simpler. Once you follow the rental price argument, it's simpler to do the uh, purchase price. Because the purchase price of a, of a durable good or a capital good, within the context of economic calculation, what is the entrepreneur willing to pay to buy a capital good outright as opposed to renting it would just be the sum of the discounted marginal revenue products that are generated by that capital good over time. So what is the ice cream uh, vendor willing to pay to buy his, uh, his uh, freezers? He's willing to pay the revenue that's generated by having the freezer as opposed to some other combination of factors of production, over the life of the freezer, all of those revenues discounted to the present, right? What he's willing to pay in present money to buy this thing. Therefore, when he buys it, as he uses it over time, he'll earn the rate of interest because he paid the discounted marginal revenue product and he's going to earn the marginal revenue product in production. <clears throat> Okay, so the entrepreneur cannot, this is the sum of the discounted marginal revenue products over time. So let's say we, you know, we have this capital good and it generates uh, five years of uh, marginal revenue product discounted at, at these values. Then what the entrepreneur would be willing to pay today to buy this capital good is $37,500, the sum of these marginal revenue products discounted. He's not willing to pay more than that because if he did, his net worth would be negative, right? Now, he'd like to pay less than that, but he isn't able because of competition of other entrepreneurs. Other entrepreneurs will be bidding for the uh, services of these factors of production, too, and will prevent him from earning exorbitant profit or exorbitant equity, in this case, uh, by underpaying right, for the, uh, for the uh, purchase of the capital good. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, just as an aside, I mentioned already, we, we're setting aside where, uh, well, we're setting aside the source of the entrepreneur's profit Entrepreneurial profit is earned for better anticipation on the part of the entrepreneur for what the actual marginal revenue products will be in the future, right? What the proper discount rates will be in the future. We're, we're uh, just setting that aside. So we're, we're just talking about the capitalist who's lending into this process and earning an interest return. Right? So that's, again, undertaken in, in other lectures. <clears throat> uh, okay, so now let's just uh, apply this to uh, economic calculation. Um, we've got the two forms now of economic calculation, uh, net income and net worth. And uh, as we uh, spoke about this morning, the entrepreneur uh, or the entrepreneurs in the economy use uh, net income, the calculation of net income or in gross profit, in order to make production decisions. Given that they have a, a, an existing uh, operation with, with complementary factors of production, they need to know, you know what goods should we produce, the ice cream vendor, what flavors of ice cream, you know, uh, how many workers to hire, what should their shifts look like, where should we locate the building uh, or the facility, uh, what, you know, where do we buy our, uh, or lease our uh, equipment from, and so on and so forth. He's making all these production decisions, <clears throat> thinking through uh, uh, the questions of how to allocate the factors of production. Uh, and this, as we uh, spoke about this morning, this is done, uh, uh, what's behind, uh, what's uh, being brought forth behind this, uh, that's being done in this process is the satisfaction, the better satisfaction, the more full satisfaction of our preferences 
it's economizing, right? Every time the entrepreneur earns profit, he's, he's taken resources, he's bid resources away from other entrepreneurs who would have produced them to produce some other good that is preferred less by consumers, and he's devoted uh, these factors of production to a production process that the consumers prefer more. How do we know this? He's earning profit. The consumers are paying more to buy his good than they are to buy his competitors' goods, relatively speaking, right? relative to the factors of production being used. <clears throat> now with net worth, uh, what the entrepreneurs use net worth as an economic calculation to uh, determine is capital investment. So here the question is, what, what asset combinations uh, will the entrepreneur bring under his or her direction? How are the different assets combined under an entrepreneurial group and uh, overseen by this entrepreneurial group? Why, uh, why should we have a General Motors that has uh, this particular uh, divisional uh, uh, combination of assets? You know, the Chevy division and so on and so forth. How did the uh, owners of, well, General Motors maybe isn't the best example, but let, let's assume that they weren't bailed out. How would the uh, uh, owners of General Motors figure out, uh, you know, we're going to shutter the Pontiac division and not the Chevy division. We're going to sell off these assets or we're going to mothball these assets. Um, what was the uh, division that they sold to uh, Spiker Motors? They sold one of their divisions to Spiker Motors. I can't remember the name. Uh, I don't think it was Hummer, it was, uh, well, Saab, it was Saab, huh? yeah, right. So how did they decide this, right? How did, how did the owners of Spiker Motors decide, look, you know, uh, we, if we buy these assets, we will increase the value of our company. Well, they're doing economic calculation of net worth, right? They're saying, if, if we have these assets, they're actually worth more under our direction than they are under the direction of those bailed out, uh, uh, you know, old, uh, old guard fogies at General Motors. We know how better to satisfy consumer preferences with these assets than they do. And if we buy them, the value of them will actually be greater. And since the liability we have to pay to buy them away from these losers, is lower than the value when we get it, we've added to our net worth. So that's what is going on with net worth uh, calculations, with capital value calculations. <clears throat> now, uh, this, uh, this uh, determination of capital value then uh, is the basis for um, the allocation of capital funding into the acquisition of assets and, the, and the, of course the production and acquisition of assets. And as uh, Mises was fond of saying, the pinnacle of capital allocation is the stock market. So let's just follow through with this discussion of uh, capital valuation to think about how it relates to the stock market. <clears throat> so common stock is just ownership shares in the net worth of a company. That's why they're called equities, right? Stocks are equities. It just means that whoever possesses the equity has a pro rata ownership share of the equity or the net worth of the firm. Obviously, then the price of a share of stock will go up and down depending upon the equity or the net worth of the firm. So if the firm better satisfies consumer preferences through production and earns net income, if they have earnings, right, their stock price will go up. If they acquire assets that are worth more than their liabilities, their stock price will go up right, as they uh, add net worth or equity uh, in that fashion um, uh, to their operation. So there's a, there's a basic connection between uh, stock prices and net worth and a basic connection between net worth and the satisfaction of our preferences. Right? These are all uh, logically in the stream of uh, explanation uh, that we started on this morning. Now, uh, th this doesn't, though, explain how stock markets allocate capital. What Mises said is that the, the pinnacle of capital allocation, not the pinnacle of just saying what capital is, right? Saying, oh, this firm has this much capital because its, it's stock price is X and it has this m number of shares outstanding and so it has a capitalization value of Y. It's not that, right? And this comes about, of course, through uh, stock investor uh, expectations, through stock speculation, right? Investors... Uh, invest in these companies and they, they buy shares of stock anticipating that in the future the, this entrepreneurial group will actually increase the net worth of the company through earnings and asset acquisitions and 
cost-cutting and so on and so forth, all of these measures, right? So we have outside, outside of, the, of the enterprise, we have outside investors who are determining actually the capital value of these companies. Uh, my uh, pet example of this, of course, is Amazon. Remember when Amazon.com uh, started up in, in the mid-1990s, uh, for almost 10 years, they never earned any uh, profit. Never earned it, right? Never had any positive uh, net income statements. And yet their stock price kept going up and up and up. Well, I mean, how's it, well, you know, what's going on? Well, what's going on is outside investors saw the potential here and they continued to bid for the ownership of what they believe would be the forthcoming future net worth of Amazon. And what they did is bid the stock price up today, which capitalized uh, Bezos today. Right? So if the stock price is bid up today, the, this just means that the assets that the uh, company owns, that uh, the entrepreneurs own, is greater today. They can actually take these assets and sell them at those elevated prices today to these other people, right? And if your assets go up and your liabilities haven't changed because the entrepreneurs are bidding your assets up, well, you can, now you can take on more liabilities, right? You can capitalize that value just by taking on debt. It's just like in the housing boom when you know, uh, all the housing prices were being bid up around mine, that the, uh, my housing price might have gone from something like $200,000 to three hundred. dollars I could have actually sold my house at the top of the boom maybe at that price. But I don't have to sell my house in order, in order to capitalize myself from that increased asset value, right? I can take out a second mortgage. I, by the way, I didn't do this, but <laughs> for obvious uh, reasons. Um, but, but, uh, but this is the way the process works, right, for entrepreneurs as well. <clears throat> okay, now let me finish by talking about the uh, distinction between capital accumulation that's undertaken in uh, the normal process of economic progress and the uh, boom-bust cycle. So capital value is an integral part of this uh, discussion as well. So economic progress uh, is set in motion by a lowering of time preferences on the part of people, where when people lower their time preferences, then they shift the allocation of their uh, resources away from producing uh, consumer goods more directly towards producing capital goods. So they save and invest more and they consume less. Right, so the, the additional spending then, so this additional saving and investing goes through credit markets typically, interest rates are lowered, uh, entrepreneurs borrow, or they're able again to advance funds more readily at lower interest rates in production processes. So they step up production processes because the entrepreneurs are buying more capital goods. Remember in our capital structure diagram, we're shifting demand from the lower stages to the upper stages. So the prices of the upper stage goods are rising. The capital value of those things are going up. The capital value of a steel mill is going up or the capital value of an iron mine is going up. And so production begins to move towards what is now more profitable, right? These, these uh, longer, more uh, productive production processes that are set in motion by our uh, preference under the assumption, our preference to intertemporally uh, reallocate resources away from more immediate uh, uh, satisfaction of consumptive ends to um, uh, further in the future uh, satisfaction of consumer ends. Now the production structure, as we suggested before, is built up along particular lines of production in the capital structure, right? It isn't just a macro, uh, an aggregated macro effect where we, all we have in the process is shifting from C to S, right, in the in the uh, C plus uh, I plus G or C plus S plus G uh, equation. No, it's, it's that particular lines of production will be increased depending upon what in particular is being preferred more highly. So it could be that uh, you know, production is being geared up to, uh, uh, as I suggested, maybe uh, expand the uh, uh, production of uh, certain raw materials like coal or uh, oil, you know, the really economizing uh, fuels. Um, and, uh, or it might be something else. It might be that uh, new technologies are being invested in which will lead to the eventual production of better computers or some other such thing. So, uh, so this is all sustainable, as uh, Roger Garrison likes to say, precisely because it's satisfying our preferences. Our time preferences have gone down. 
The capital values in the economy change based upon this because our demands are changing throughout the economy. Interest rates uh, are also changing. <clears throat> and this is just reflecting the way our preferences have, have been altered. Now, when we think about the boom-bust uh, process, it superficially appears similar, right? The boom starts because interest rates are lower, uh, more funds, are, more, more credit is being extended, uh, as interest rates go down, capital values rise, funds, the borrowed money starts to pour into particular lines of uh, uh, capital or durable consumer goods perhaps, uh, housing and so on, uh, steel production, timber operations and what have you. And so there's a superficial similarity between the two processes. But they're set in motion in entirely different ways, and it isn't, again, uh, too difficult to see uh, the distinction here. Economic progress is set in motion by a change in our preferences, and therefore, as production patterns change to satisfy our preferences, they're sustainable, precisely because they satisfy our preferences. <clears throat> With credit expansion through monetary inflation, the, the, uh, the economic calculation that entrepreneurs are engaged in is, is not set in motion by a change in our preferences. Our preferences haven't changed at all. It's set in motion by monetary inflation and credit expansion. So we get a different cause setting this process in motion. And what makes it, of course, unsustainable is precisely that this new pattern of production, this new structure of production that's being produced by uh, the process of the credit expansion does not, in the end, satisfy our preferences. Our time preferences are uh, different from the pattern of production, from the extended longer production processes that are being stretched out uh, by the capital uh, expansion process. And so eventually, th th something has to give, right? We, we can't go on forever producing a line of production that will not satisfy our preferences. Eventually, th these two will come to a head, so to speak, and something must give. And in the market economy, as we well know, well, and in human life in general, what gives are the physical things. <laughs> the cause of all, of all the physical attributes of our actions are the ends that we wish to satisfy. The preferences that we have will dominate in the end. Uh, this precisely because it couldn't be otherwise as long as we have some semblance of a market economy where we're uh, you know, permitted to spend our income and have our preferences expressed. And so this, we say that the uh, boom process is uh, self-reversing. Right? It goes on for a while, but eventually something occurs that indicates to the capitalist investor that this whole process of building up these lines of production are not going to match our preferences these are not going to be profitable lines of investment pretty soon, and you better get out now, right? And the crash comes, and the uh, correction of the capital values, and so on, uh, that, that are necessary then to re-employ all the mal-invested capital uh, structure into uh, lines of production that then do pr uh, prove to be uh, profitable according to our preferences as they emerge in this future period. So again, I've exhausted my time and we'll stop uh, here. Thank you.